Pia koto, na mauna, na awa, na waka, na tupuno, aotearoa, me te whenua, rauahi, e hui hui mane, tena koto katoa. Warm Pacific greetings to you all from New Zealand's shores to what we fondly call the Western Isle, to our colleagues, friends, compadres in Australia and beyond. Um, ko Sydney Shep, taku inua, he kaifakahere o Waitiata Press, te tarifarita o Waitiata, o te Heranawaka Victoria University of Wellington, here in Wellington, New Zealand, te Wanganui Atara. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to host our esteemed national librarian, Rachel Essen, uh, and to be thinking through uh, what is a particularly salient example of how we can create, build, and sustain communities in our discipline. I thought in terms of focusing our attention for this afternoon's talk, um, I'd quote a bit from an author whom many of you will know if you learnt French at an early age as I did and had to read Le Petit Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. And he has this amazing idea of, and I'll read it, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So today we're going to participate in voyaging, exploring, discovering with our wayfinder of the afternoon, Rachel Essen. Now, Rachel is the newly or relatively newly appointed Te Fuaki, National Librarian of New Zealand. She's the ninth person to have fulfilled that role. And she comes with a distinguished career in the library profession uh, but what do cicadas, physiotherapy, and economics have in common? Well, these are past lives of our keynote speaker, Rachel, and you can always ask a question of her about that in our Q&A facility or open a discussion in the chat for later in the piece. But she's basically come full circle. She started out as a library assistant uh, in the photographic collections um, at the National Library of New Zealand. Uh, she went away for a little while and joined us at Victoria University of Wellington, where she was very involved in working with researchers, working with um, academics, and understanding that space. And then she went back to the National Library, into the Turnbull Library, where she had responsibilities for um, academic research libraries. She was Associate Chief Librarian of the Research Collections. And uh, now, as you can see, she's been elevated to this amazing position, which is both empowering and I suspect daunting, but Rachel's committed to collaboration and re really reinvigorating the role of the National Library to support the library sector, yes, but I would go further and say the glamour sector in general, both in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Oceania and globally. So, Today, her talk is building a regional community of DH practice. Um, being an academic, we can query what regional and what community might mean, but I think let's focus on the yes we can. In an era where um, major events have occurred that has shifted um, our understandings of who we are as human beings, uh, I think it's valuable to step back for a moment and think positively, optimistically, about what we can do in the future. So Rachel's talk proposes that building on shared values will grow a strong community of practice in our region between our various sectors. And in this context, she'll explore the challenges and opportunities for digital humanities in particular, in the context of the COVID-19 crisis. She'll share how the National Library has contributed to this space in the past and how that role could be expanded in the future. And she'll also look ahead to a possible future of greater regional cross-sector collaboration. So with that, I'd like to invite you to join me in welcoming Rachel to this webinar, uh, to engage with her uh, both during her talk in the Q&A and definitely after in the Q&A, keep that discussion going and alive in the chat 
And we're hoping amongst the 42 participants that I see who have joined us, that we'll have a robust discussion about what does the future look like for us in this moment, uh, timely moment of collaboration between cultural institutions and the very broad church domain of digital humanities. Over to you, Rachel. Kia ora. Kia tangi no mai te kihi kihi ponamu. Ko manawatu te manawarahi, manawatu te kai whakamaru. Kia raro iho e onamata ki na ringa o oku mātua. No reira ko Rachel Essen toko ingoa. No te papa oia ahau. Ko te pohoaki o te puna mataranga o Aotearoa takumahi. Ko te pohoaki ahau. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you, Sydney, for that marvellous introduction and scene setting. And thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about building communities of practice for digital humanities. Sydney mentioned cicadas or kihi kihi uh, in the introduction, and that is something that I refer to in my pepeha. Uh, my father was an entomologist and cicadas were his specialty. So a lot of my childhood was spent collecting samples of kihi kihi from around Aotearoa. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to start my presentation by pointing out the te reo name for the National Librarian, Te Pohuaki. The name was gifted by the library's Te Committee Māori, an advisory committee, and it's based on the Pepeha and Waiata written by Faya Bella Tarafiti for Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa. In this Waiata and Pepeha, uh, it goes like this. Kōkiri, kōkiri, kōkiri. Whakaranga akeo ki nā re, reo o te motu. E karangana mai ana huakina mai nā tato o whare. Kia mahi tahi tato, kia inu ai mai mato i te puna mataranga o Aotearoa. A message from the people clearly asks us to open our doors so that we may work together and share the information held in Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa. It's a unique title and an original compound word, and it's both descriptive and aspirational. And in preparing for this presentation today and reflecting on the conference theme, Creating Communities, it seems to me that both my role and that of Te Puna Mataranga o Aotearoa can have a significant and positive impact in supporting and helping to keep building communities of practice for digital humanities in Australasia. Next slide, please. The purpose of the National Library, according to our legislation, it's rather dry, but it's basically collect uh, preserve and protect and make accessible documents and documentary heritage, particularly that relating to New Zealand. Uh, we also have a role to supplement and further the work of other libraries. And as Sydney referred to, we have a broader uh, opportunity that is set out in our legislation about working collaboratively with other institutions having similar purposes. And that's the bit that I think is particularly important for today's discussion. Next slide. We fulfill this legislative purpose through our strategic directions. The library's strategic directions work is structured around these three key themes, taonga, collections, reading, and that's through our literacy and learning directorate, knowledge with a specific emphasis on that broader cross-sector outcome. And these three strategic areas of focus are intertwined. An example of that is we have a current books and Māori digitization project. 
It sits in the Taonga strand of our strategic directions work, but many aspects of that work, such as digitization standards, conservation of physical materials, consultation with iwi rights management, including data sovereignty, sit in the knowledge theme and the external use of the completed digital material, uh, for example, can support the school's curriculum and our reading theme. But my presentation today will primarily focus on the knowledge theme. And I'm going to say right now at the outset that I'm really keen to hear from you as part of this discussion. So my presentation's not super long. I'm not taking up a whole hour. Uh, I'd like to leave plenty of time for discussion. And I'd also like to say I'm not a technical expert. Uh, I'm well supported by my colleagues, and in particular, my colleague, Andrea Gothels, who is the NDHA manager. And the last caveat is I just want to say that we have been experiencing a few internet issues here in Wellington uh, within the Department of Internal Affairs today. Uh, I'm very hopeful that it's all resolved, but apologies in advance if I'm a little bit glitchy. Next slide, please. So looking at that knowledge uh, aspect of our strategic directions, all of these bullet points on this slide are taken directly from the strategic directions work that we have done in looking at how we can realize those strate that strategic ambition. I hope that you'll agree that they've all got direct and obvious connections and relevance to the themes of the conference this week. They're relevant if we're going to have a conversation about what a national knowledge system might look like and how a coordinated digital humanities offering might look like within that wider knowledge system. So how are we doing on delivering these strategic aspirations? Well, we can always do better. And of course, since 2020, there've been some unexpected challenges along the way. Next slide, please. Like all other organizations, the National Library's had to adapt to a new normal that a COVID-19 pandemic has brought. What's changed that might affect the way we operate and the services that we provide? Next slide, please. In many ways, physical spaces, especially physical community spaces, have become lost due to lockdowns and social distancing. We do so many more things online now. We work, shop, socialize. Our technical infrastructure and having digital access to information have become essential both to our livelihoods and for many, our mental health. Unfortunately, a lot of people have been hit economically by this pandemic. So there isn't as much resource for what might be considered non-essentials. The overall effect is that it exacerbates existing social inequities and widens the digital divide. Next slide, please. In a report written by the Greater Wellington Regional Council last year, they analyzed what they thought would be the impact of COVID on the Wellington area under different scenarios. Scenario one was the best case scenario and scenario three, the worst case. In any scenario, the impact on economic and social well-being was negative. And some of the reasons they listed for rating the social impacts as negative were the ability of many to access important cultural sites and attend significant events was negatively impacted. Community engagement was vastly reduced. Arts and cultural resources were likely to be significantly impacted in the short term and they estimated would need significant support to recover. Next slide, please. What has this meant for digital humanities? Because many libraries and archives have not been able to be physically open, it's affected access to collections that are not already digitized. During this time, the digital humanities haven't received the funding focus that's been given to STEM disciplines. 
in 2018 in response to the proposed funding of research of a research infrastructure investment plan in Australia, one response pointed out that less than 1% of proposed funding over a five year timeframe was allocated for digital humanities projects. While the digital humanities workforce makes up 41% of Australia's research workforce. Another recent study of researchers and members of the research offices in the UK, the US and Australia found that COVID-19 has significantly impacted research funding with STEM subjects seeing increases in available funding to the detriment of non-STEM subjects. So it does seem to be a continuing theme. Next slide, please. Ex Libris recently commissioned a report to understand how researchers and university research officers are experiencing the latest trends in, ac in academic research. They surveyed over 400 researchers and research office leaders across the UK, United States and Australia in an array of disciplines. This graph shows the result of asking them how COVID has affected research funding at their institution. More than half of the arts and humanities researchers said they had slightly less or a lot less funding in the year since the pandemic began. Next slide. However, where there are challenges, there can also be opportunities. As the saying goes, you don't let a crisis go to waste. Uh, and I believe there are significant opportunities for digital humanities and the digital space in general. And I'm interested to hear if you agree. Technical debts become more apparent and in a security conscious world, it's become a priority for addressing that technical debt and fixing security issues. Fully virtual events such as conferences like this have become normal, viable and increasingly sophisticated. There's more emphasis on open access and online accessibility. Expectations for what should be available online have increased significantly. We heard from our university library colleagues that one of the biggest challenges during lockdowns was the lack of digitized in copyright New Zealand material particularly books. This means opportunities to work with publishers to make this content available. There's an increasing awareness of the need to manage digital assets on a long term basis, databases, image collections, maps, websites, software, and possibly most important of all, there's recognition that community and collaboration are increasingly important to overcome challenges. All of which raises the question of the role of digital humanities and understanding the impacts of COVID-19 over time. Next slide, please. The National Library is in the business of developing collections with a primary focus on New Zealand and Pacific, physical and digital, and preserving them for the long term. We're also in the business of increasing access to our physical collections through digitization, ensuring our collections are in digital form and available and accessible for new modes of research. Social media platforms, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, etc., uh, bring their own different challenges and our current legislation doesn't provide the mandate to collect these platforms where many New Zealanders act out a lot of their lives. Simultaneously, an increasing digital world, including social media platforms, are increasingly important to us as they provide greater flexibility as we endeavour to extend our collecting across more diverse communities. These digital collections form the basis of digital humanities projects. There's a wide range of formats covering a multitude of events and themes, COVID-19, Kaikoura earthquakes, te reo content. Our current books and Māori project will result in approximately 1,500 uh, 1, items in te reo being available for full text searching. The next steps, how to make that accessible is data to the digital humanities community. 
Next slide, please. So the National Library has been dabbling in this space for some time, participating in a range of workshops, hackfests, competitions since 2010. Our role has usually been to supply the data. Next step, uh, next slide, please. We currently provide a number of downloadable data sets, including Publications New Zealand, which is the national bibliography that includes both monographs and serials, Papers Past data set, which comprises the whole of Papers Past published prior to 1900. That date was chosen um, as that material was likely to be out of copyright. We're currently doing an impact assessment for that project, but we're aware of two completed pieces of work, one an investigation into philosophical discourse in early New Zealand newspapers, and the second researching the first wave of avian introductions into New Zealand. Next slide, please. In 2015, we undertook our first internal project using a selection of 26,000 digitized newspapers comprising the World War I papers past corpus. Uh, I think I cut out a little bit, so I'll just say that, but again, in 2015, we undertook our first internal project using a selection of 26,000 digitized newspapers comprising the World War I Papers Past Corpus. Programmer and artist Douglas Bagnall examined the reporting around World War I using data from papers past uh, from newspapers on papers past published between 1913 and 1922 to see if the use of particular terms could be mapped over time. While it wasn't entirely successful, Uh, the project did throw up some interesting lessons, including the importance of quality data from the outset. While that was unsurprising in itself, it was a little bit sobering, given our reliance on uh, OCR in the digitization process. This experiment looked at ways in which algorithms might be used to increase our understanding of a flawed but valuable corpus. There's, there wasn't one definite aim, but three related strands. We were interested in the possibility of creating tools for historians and other researchers that might offer new search methods or different holistic perspectives. And we were also looking to find some means to improve the digitization quality of the papers past corpus, or at least to understand the scope of where it needed improvement. And the, thirdly, the investigation served as a test case for providing a larger portion of the corpus to independent researchers. There is more information about that project on our blog. In 2018, we undertook a facial recognition project. The purpose of the project was to ascertain whether facial recognition tools would help improve access to unidentified carte de visite portraits held in the Alexander Turnbull Library, with a particular focus on identifying portraits of unnamed Māori. That raised its own issues regarding tikanga and other cultural considerations such as data sovereignty. The project was also interesting with the large amount of data highlighting issues with processing power and data storage. And again, not surprisingly, tools trained on a largely European data set showed themselves to be less sensitive to other ethnicities. Next slide, please. 
More recently, we've been working on an international internet preservation consortium funded project to develop, develop Jupyter notebooks focused on data and tools designed for analysis of large scale web archives. This is in conjunction with colleagues at the UK Web Archive, the National Library of Australia and the Internet Archive. Next slide, please. So where to next? COVID-19 has provided some opportunities for us to fast track some things that we had in development. And by fast track, I mean fast track for a government department. So not entirely speedy. Uh, we are piloting a virtual reading room which is giving access to things that can usually only be accessed on site, giving access to researchers uh, virtually. We're delivering open data sets and dabbling with digital humanities projects and tools. And we know we need to develop a coherent policy framework, incorporating rights, privacy, terms of use and takedown. But how do we contribute to big data analysis in the humanities. The New Zealand, uh, the .nz web domain, we've collected 10 years of that, all of papers passed, Twitter data sets. How do we support text mining and other forms of computational analysis? How do we build and maintain long-term support structures for digital humanities services in New Zealand, including leveraging our current mandate and expertise to protect and preserve digital assets, thereby enhancing the likelihood of research data being safe for the long term and ensuring the reproducibility of scholarship. How do we leverage and develop librarians' information management skills, description information management, rights management into digital humanities projects? And how do we engage fully in the digital research process? Are we just providers of content or do we have a deeper role to play which ties in directly with our strategic directions and the notion of a national knowledge system? We're working more closely with Archives New Zealand and Ngā Taonga. This is an opportunity that we have that is uh, built on the fact that there is going to be a physical building next door to the National Library in Molesworth Street, and that Ngā Taonga have uh, moved in are currently housed within the National Library building. So that gives us um, already a good start for collaboration. But what does it look like and what is the role of the National Library in this collaboration? And this is where I'm really interested to hear from you. It's a conversation that we would like to progress with this community. We can imagine these examples of how different sectors could contribute. And we'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on this. And last slide. And I understand that during that, my internet wasn't very good, so that my camera was turned off. I hope you did get to hear most of that. Namihi, Rachel. Yes, we did. Uh, just a couple of dropouts, but you covered beautifully. So I think we can go back into your um, video and uh, let's stop screen sharing and let's open the discussion. So there's been a bit of movement on the chat and we've had a few shout outs here for events that are going to be happening later in the week, including Joshua Black's work, which will be presented and Tim Sherritt's in the audience. So hello, Tim, you'll be uh, crossing over from ResBaz, but glad to have you around the table here and a good shout out for the work you and Andrew are doing. Um, while we're waiting for a huge range of questions or comments to come in via the Q&A function on our webinar, I thought I'd start off. You gave some, some pretty gutsy kinds of uh, stats there, Rachel, in the Australian context. The ones about 1% funding and 46% of the DH in the, work, in the research workforce. 
I mean, that's a pretty dramatic and very sobering kind of statistic to share with us. But it is the reality of um, life as a digital humanist, life in the humanities and even social science lane. So I'm wondering, you've got an exceptional wish list there. And I think it's something that all digital humanists would love to see. But how do we go from small scale prototyping or pilot studies into embedding some of the practices of digital humanities into business as usual in institutions like yourself. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the areas that uh, I always rabbit on about is it's a culture shift in a way. Uh, in many ways, librarians have been trained to be service providers and they're very good at that job. They're curators, they're managers of information, they create metadata and they preserve collections. But what would it look like for those librarians or people in the glamour sector to be co-researchers, just not service providers? Mm -hmm. Have you got a, something that you'd like to say around that while I start harvesting some of our Q&As? Thanks, Sydney. Great questions. And yes, I do have a lot to say on that subject. <laughs> I think it's extremely important for librarians to be partners in research. And the reason I think that's important is because it helps them understand the research process and how they can then add value. And I think my background, having been a uh, a medical librarian and working, I was employed by Otago University, but worked here at the Wellington School of Medicine and actually was a co-teacher and co-researcher in a number of uh, projects. And I think that really taught me the value of that. Um, I think one of the, um, the challenges with that is the confidence that librarians need to develop to actually see that they've got value to add in terms of that. I think um, there is that sense that, uh, that they don't have such an understanding of the research process and that they might get it wrong. I think we are sometimes um, a profession that that worries a bit much about getting it wrong. And actually, as we know, research is as much about, you learn as much from getting things wrong as you do from getting things right. So I think that is a bit of a mind shift that librarians need to have. Uh, I also think that comment about the pilot projects and moving them from being um, projects into business as usual, and how do we do that? I th that's where I think the collaboration, the strength of working together and advocating to move things into being business as usual can really help. Um, it might be that you need funding from various strands, but to be able to actually do things in partnership. Um, to Upuku Tukutuku is a really good example of something that started as a pilot project between Lianza Tarofakaho, the Māori um, librarians group, and the National Library. And that it, it was project funded for a long time. And we're just now starting to bring it together into business as usual. Uh, but I think part of the value of that three groups working together has helped demonstrate the value of it. And I've been able to then get that ongoing funding. Not all of it, <laughs> but we're getting there. Thanks for that, Rachel. We've, we've got a cluster of questions around digitized historical materials emerging and uh, Brian Flaherty uh, in this space has been in this space for quite some time. Um, and he refers to your comment on the uh, uh, Books and Māori digitization project um, and the value for researchers is in the size of the data, the corpus. You know, we talk about big data. We also talk about rich data um, and, and uh, what, Brian is interested in is papers past a single national data source that digital humanists are using, but can the National Library cooperate with other NZ GLAM organizations? And he's suggesting University of Auckland, Victoria University of Wellington libraries that have digitized New Zealand text to create a single national corpus that includes books, journals, potentially uh, ephemera of one sort or another. And that's a question that also emerges uh, 
with Ingrid Mason, who's talking about um, developing global data sets that support better computational access to research. So thinking around digitized historical newspapers is just one example, establishing ethical and practical collection processes so that you know we've got the potential of having a local national corpus, but situating that within a broader uh, international or global corpus. What's happening at the National Library now in those spaces? And what do you see as you're projecting five, 10 years down the track? Mm, great questions. Thank you, Brian and Ingrid. Shout out to you both. Uh, yeah, so absolutely, I would love to see a, a single data set for New Zealand that included paper uh, newspapers, journals, you know, all of that digitized content. Um, and I think, you know, that is a conversation that we're starting to have with these, uh, with the knowledge network ambition and aspiration. We know that um, it's a lofty idea and the devil is in the detail. Uh, and we also know that papers passed in its current form is, uh, needs a bit of work. It's possibly not the ideal platform uh, for accessing and for what we can do with it, but we do have aspirations in that area. And, and yes, linking up globally is, I think, you know, there's huge value in that. We are always very conscious in terms of doing that, conscious of things like data sovereignty, um, and particularly with the books and Māori corpus, that there may need to be, or there will be, um, discussions and consultation to be able to provide access to that in an appropriate way. Uh, so that we have someone engaging with iwi as we're, um, digitizing the content and we're having those discussions now so that when we make it available it is being made available in a way that is um, culturally appropriate uh, and I think that is one of the challenges with the global access um, we have had some discussions with international colleagues in the past uh, and there's not always a recognition of some of those cultural issues about some of the data um, and so you know, we have to progress carefully in that in that area. But yes. Great. Thank yes, you. Yes, we can at some point. <laughs> We've got a brace of questions coming in around access um, and format. So I want to go to mm. the format one first. Um, and this is from Gavin Finley. He says, do you think there's scope for libraries to collect more video? In this age, digital video is just another form of data. And his research in particular is in digital theater archives. AV archives are few and tend to focus on film, sound and broadcast media. So specifically digital video, are you able to speak about Natong sound and vision initiatives uh, and where those situate within the library and also what the library itself might be doing in this space? Mm. Well, it's a great question, and we are very aware of how much video content is created daily, and the fact, I think, that there is quite a gap in terms of what is being collected. One of the challenges that we have is just the, the tools and the data storage and the access and description to that format. We aren't particularly well set up for that, and that is where... Um, the closer collaboration with our colleagues in Ngā Taonga um, and looking at what the collecting priorities for the future are, I think provides that opportunity to make sure that we are addressing some of those current gaps. So yes, we're aware of it. We don't have all of the answers yet uh, and would love to hear your ideas and suggestions about how we can start to address that. Great, thank you. Um, as I mentioned, we've got some access questions and that's everything from Joshua Black who's talking about um, digitization has got to be something more than a once off. You know, multiple iterations as technology changes, um, improves hopefully, reprocessing of material for um, say higher quality OCR 
etc. And then another access question is the one around uh, copyright, mm -hmm. with um, changes to copyright laws actually preventing potential access. So on both those fronts, you know, as a researcher, often you research in an area and then funders assume it's already being done. So they don't want to look at you again. They don't want to uh, think about extensions of projects that, that last. So the idea of bedding in digitization within a project is good, but it doesn't necessarily deal with issues around um, long-term migration, preservation, let alone reprocessing of those materials. But I guess you sort of alluded to in the, um, with the copyright question, you alluded to the open access to the papers past archive to 1900, um, but what's the impact of copyright for access? So we've got a technical question and then this one about access all in the same space. Mm. So yes, digitization, if, if only we had the resource that it wasn't a one-off and that we could re-digitize. And we're constantly making that um, prioritization call. Is it better to have something that has been digitized and at least is available in that way and to continue to put resource into material that currently isn't available digitally at all? Uh, you know, balancing that is, is something that we're doing all of the time. Uh, and so far, most of the resource has gone into continuing to digitize material that isn't currently available in a digital format, rather than uh, improving the quality of what we've already digitized. Um, and, you know, we'll have to continue to evaluate that and, and make that call. Uh, and, and at a certain point, we will need to go back and, and re-digitize some material. But right now, we, we are continuing to just extend what is available. I would love to have um, all of the resource that I currently uh, put towards keeping books like the Overseas Published Collection. <laughs> I would love to put that towards digitizing and making more uh, material accessible. Um, copyright is, is a real challenge for us. And the resource that it takes to clear things that are in copyright, the resource that it takes to try and navigate orphan works and to take a risk-based approach um, is, it's phenomenal. Uh, and being a government department, we are more risk averse, I think, than some of our academic colleagues are able to be in a university setting. So that is an ongoing issue for us. Uh, we're very conscious of the issue um, and we are you know, working very hard to be able to advocate for access. We see that as a key role. And balancing the rights of content creators, but really libraries, we need to be advocating for that access side. I think the content creators uh, have a fairly strong voice already. So um, we, we're hoping we can provide a bit of balance in that conversation. My colleague Paul Miller has raised another point and it's continuing that kind of consultative conversation and the possibilities. He says, do you have advice on what we as digital humanists need to do to have our voices heard by central policy makers and funders and how we can influence potentially national organizations like the National Library? Mm -hmm. So how do we get in the room at the start of the conversation rather than being, you know, hearing a strategic initiative or consulted after the framework's already in place um, as often happens. So we feel disenfranchised, um, our expertise isn't valued and we aren't necessarily able to share some of the kind of uh, creative and innovative uh, perspectives that we might bring to these spaces. How, so Paul's question is how might an association like AADH find itself being consulted more regularly? 
Mm, great question, Paul. And I think opportunities like this uh, is a really good starting point because what that does is it puts on the National Library's radar um, the fact that these conversations are happening and some of the initiatives that you have underway and the value that they can add and where we can contribute. Um, but I think it, it comes back to the, the relationships and the engagement and, you know, continuing to look for the things where we can work on things together uh, to be able to, it, it, it sort of takes me back to that point C under the National Library purpose, where it's institutions that have similar purposes. And I think we can see that there's some really clear alignment between what digital humanities is trying to do and what the National Library is trying to do. Um, so I think it's continuing to find those points of alignment and to raise that, um, yeah, to raise that discussion so that we can have it at the beginning, as you say, rather than when it's, when it's already been formed and we're just saying, are we on the right track or not? I think one opportunity that I can signal uh, is that we will be starting to refresh our collection development policy and approach. Uh, and I think that is an, an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, we, we will be consulting, but actually we can start to have some conversations early about, you know, what is the National Library's collecting role? And I think that's where things like um, the video content question earlier, you know, let's have some input into what can our role be in terms of that. One of the things that we are really shifting away from is that the sense that the National Library is the library of last resort and that we have to, uh, physically or digitally own a copy of everything. Um, it's more that we can provide that connection through that knowledge network. Uh, we can provide the links and we can provide some of the backbone support, but we don't need to be the institution that holds and collects everything. But let's make sure that we've had that national conversation so that we can minimize the gaps and minimize the duplication. We're too small a country, too small a region uh, in terms of Australasia to be duplicating. Yeah, let's, let's probe a bit further um, that regional context. But before we do that, um, just picking up a point that Ingrid has mentioned uh, as uh, framed up as another question. I know from colleagues, colleagues who are working in Stats New Zealand that the five safes have been rolled out as a very important te tiriti kind of inflected um, consultation and building relationship um, activity. Um, the five safes in Australia in a social science framework are operationalizing this through um, what's called the data availability and transparency bill going through the federal parliament. So the five safe framework means safe people, safe projects, safe data, safe outputs, safe settings. And Ingrid's question is, this the moment for heritage collecting organizations to begin exploring other authorization and curatorial control models like the five safes as part of their practice change? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the context of indigenizing collections and power sharing, uh, having a model and a framework like that is something that we're, that's where we're heading. We are at the very beginning. And I think what we're starting to see even at the beginning of this journey is that for heritage institutions or glam institutions like the National Library that are part of a central government department, it's already apparent that we are going to be really challenging our authorizing environment. I think we will be wanting to go a bit faster than the authorizing environment is ready for. And that's okay. We just need to be aware that we're we might have to 
slow down a little bit to bring that authorizing environment with us. Uh, but we're up for that. We're up for that challenge. One of the things that the library has been uh, really focusing on is is our relationship with Iwi Māori, um, with mana whenua in, initially, but more widely. And one of the things I've been doing just this la uh, past week is recruiting for a kaihotu role on the National Library's leadership team. We haven't had a position at that level for over 10 years. Uh, there's also a a similar position being recruited in Archives New Zealand. And so that's an indication of investment uh, and an indication that it's not, you know, we're not continuing to talk about it without actually really investing and supporting uh, our kaimahi to, to start that work. Hmm. Thank you for that. Um... I think we're, we're winding up, if not winding down. We've got a few more questions coming to the table. <clears throat> um, but I'm wondering if we can talk a bit about the regional context in which um, your mahi in the National mm. Library and, and New Zealand's mahi in general in these spaces. Um, because your title was a regional community of DH. Mm. Um, what do you imagine that regional community to look like and you call it regional community, not regional communities. So <laughs> can you unpack your title a little bit more for us and just tell us uh, what your current initiatives are in this regional space, um, which is as broad or as small as you can make it? And what kind of community or communities are you wanting to connect with? And I think that's a really good point, um, Sydney, is that really it is communities. Uh, in the same way, I think that uh, Aotearoa is, has um, indicated and is working towards a new histories curriculum, and it's recognizing that there is not one history, there are histories, and so similarly, there are communities. Really, I can um, speak for the National Library in terms of our ambition to reconnect uh, with our colleagues in Australia. Again, a few years ago, unfortunately, um, and mostly due to uh, financial issues, we withdrew from being part of the National and State Libraries Australasia. And that was really unfortunate. And one of the things that I was able to do when I came into the role was to rejoin us uh, to that really important group. And so already we are starting to have those regional conversations with national and state libraries, in particular about the collections and, and looking at a, a regional collecting approach. Um, we know that we've got differences, but we also have a number of similarities. Uh, we have a strong focus on the Pacific um, you know, we have different relationship with different areas in the Pacific, but both Australia and New Zealand are looking at how we can support our colleagues in the Pacific and again ensuring that um, we're collecting those voices, that we're not duplicating and that we are addressing any gaps. Um, and it's not that colonial, here, give it all to us, we'll look after it for you. It's working in partnership the um, Pacific Virtual Museum is a really good example of, of an initiative where it's Australia and New Zealand working together with Pacific communities to make available uh, digital heritage. And that's using the DNZ um, infrastructure. So that's something that there's information about on our, on our website. So I think that's, a, that's an initiative where we're learning. Uh, we've still got a lot, a lot more to do in this area, and you know the national and state libraries is just one sector. I am aware that there's also that broader glam sector and the academic um, sector, uh, but I think it's kind of one step at a time. 
Well, I guess in the one step of time approach, um, in your wish list, there's things that uh, many of us have been, um, I won't say dying to hear about, but actually wanting to have um, coming up to Christmas. And so one of them is the idea of a digital lab. British Library, you know, um, the British Library Labs, for example, the um, State Library of New South Wales, DX Lab, spaces where not only digital humanists can thrive, but their work uh, is valued, it's made public, it's more in the public sphere, etc. And I guess related to that, is there any, you know, apart from National Library hosting some kind of digital lab or some kind of, um, oh, possibility of a space, whether it's distributed space or not, but aligned with that potentially the National Library Fellow, um, there being a digital humanities fellow or a digital specialist fellow or a place where the activities that we do with whether it's big or small data are recognized in that broader public domain. Are there any movements towards either of those initiatives? Uh, not right now. Um, that's not saying that there won't be. Um, and I think in particular, that idea of a, uh, a scholar or a fellow that is focused on digital humanities, I, I would love to see that and support that. I think we do tend to have a focus on the more traditional view of research and the output being often a physical um, book and I, I'd love to see you know I don't think it, it is one or the other but I would love to see more emphasis on on the digital humanities and the the projects that come out of that uh, and, I, and I think some of it is just um, encouraging people to to understand the scope and the um, the value that that adds and National Library one of the things that I think we we do offer that is really valuable is that uh, that forum and the ability to host events and we can we can do it in the hybrid world now um, but to provide that platform to promote and to share that work and that research uh, we've we've got a, a number of um, opportunities and groups that we work with to do that and so I'm really open to 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 continuing that. Well, and Tim Sherrod has just flagged, you know, the whole sustainability uh, agenda. It's, uh, it's really hard. The DX lab, as we know, is, is no longer functioning. Um, you know, that kind of innovation is really difficult. As you say, the inertia of government departments, et cetera, um, Austin and the innovators are doing off, innovating their own way. The Tim Sherrods, the Douglas Bagnalls, you know, they're doing their thing and getting their word out um, on you know, based on collections, but not necessarily um, in a sustainable way that that can inspire other people to then move forward and, and do their thing. So what role would the National Library have in uh, creating sustainable agenda, I guess, is what I'm asking about for digital humanities? Mm. You know, we have to do our part, but the collecting institutions, we would hope, would come and meet us as well. Mm. Uh, look, I, I completely agree, and this is something that um, I've been having conversations um, about recently in the context of uh, the NDF um, forum and, and the research that they're doing about digital capabilities. And I think the role of the National Library is to help advocate for funding. And we do have a challenge that for politicians to support budget bids and get funding, it, it tends to be easier when it is a physical project and they can go and cut a ribbon, ribbon on a beautiful new building. Investing in something that is a digital um, research data set or the infrastructure to support a lab, and it's not quite the same in terms of that photo opportunity and that, um, that political kind of uh, yeah, that I'm not quite sure what the word is there, but anyway. Um, so I think that is the role that we can have is to 
is to translate the importance of that into a way that our ministers can understand and may support. Um, and I think we're starting to build an awareness of that, uh, but it's certainly um, it's certainly something that you have to keep working at. Uh, and I think with our particular minister at the moment, the way in there is in terms of digital skills and digital equity in relation to education. And I think using the histories curriculum and some of the tools that we can develop to support uh, the histories curriculum and getting that into the education system, I think that will provide an in and a way to help um, help our funders understand the ongoing importance. But also open to other suggestions. <laughs> Oh, well, we let's, let, let's, let's dream another suggestion, Rachel, as we wind down here. And I want people, if they can, to participate in the chat. Okay, we're all waking up tomorrow morning. We've got 10 million New Zealand dollars in our pocket. As digital humanists and as institutions supporting digital humanities, what are we going to do with it? So I'm going to give Rachel a few minutes to just think about what that amazing opportunity might be. And I want to hear from everyone in the chat what would your dream $10 million spend up be? Huh. Go for what a, it. <laughs> what a great question. What would you spend that on? Oh, scary. Yeah. So we're in the chat now. Keep going. We always know Ingrid's fast off the mark, but I hope everyone else is typing furiously. $10 million, what would you do with it? Woohoo! Andrea's mm. got a play lab for kids in schools. Yeah. Mm. We've got the Mind Lab in New Zealand, but maybe we need something that actually builds these kinds of DH school skills in from a very early age. We're already into second generation DHers, people who are coding. You know, they're doing the hack, they're doing the yak. Mm. Let's see what else we've got. I think there's something too about the, um, you know, broadening the STEM to STEAM and getting the arts to really um, work alongside the traditional STEM. Woohoo. Nice one, Brian. Mm. Now we know all the work that Tahiko Media is doing in this space of um, speech to text uh, yeah. in the Te Reo Māori language space, but yeah, lots mm. of amazing resource out there. Mm. Computer science and there we go. We've got the STEAM to STEM and we've got the CHAS, cha cha chas Holographic lab on indigenous data collected widely in the region. Oh, Lisa Pehi, that's a really, really great, great suggestion. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of uh, virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality work going on at the moment, but channeling mm. into the lab. Brilliant. Nice one, Alexander. Thank you. And we know you know how to spell. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> any, any more? Oh, Marco, you know, let's just dream big. You are raising that sustainability question, of course. What if we said 10 million each year for 10 years? Whew, that'd be a shocker. <laughs> there you go. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs> yep. 10 million doesn't go very far, we know. But hey, you know. Anybody else have something on their wish list they want to share? You realize, Rachel, that you know the end game of this little scenario here is to give you a, a hit list to take to your policy advisors. You're going to operationalize it for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we can try. We can but try. Well, this is called consulting the community before decisions are made. So think of this as, you know, ground zero, opening the doors to 
conversation with digital humanists. So yeah, absolutely. On that note, I think we'll we'll close the proceedings. And I just wanted to to obviously thank Rachel for for a stimulating talk and one that's as is her want a very open um, one one that is genuinely collaborative one that is uh, advocating for cooperation collaboration uh, coordination and particularly conversation that idea of kororo is incredibly important in Rachel's world and in ours as well um, so in closing um, I've been really influenced by wayfinding leadership, groundbreaking wisdom for developing leaders um, by Dr. Shelley Spiller, Hotorora Barclay Kerr, and John Panaho. And this book actually, and I'll just do a, mm. there you go. For those who can see the blurred out vision, you'll remember that book cover for life. Um, not only does it use the metaphor um, of the walker and navigation um, in the context of wayfinding, but the idea of exploring and discovering is active verbs, not destination. You know, we have bucket lists. We've got uh, destination addiction. But what is the journey along the way and what, what might we miss if we luxuriate in the moment rather than looking at that far end? And at the end, the, the writers say, by retaining a sense of openness to potential and acknowledging exploration as a defining part of who we are, we position ourselves and our organizations to reap the benefits of the world of Takore, that world of potential that is released into Te Ao Marama, that world of light. So kia ora, Rachel, thank you so much. On behalf of all the participants, uh, we thank you, but I'd also like to reach out and thank the participants for an engaging with Rachel and engaging with the digital humanities community, even if you don't sell to identify as a DHer. So Kakite, we're back okay. at four o'clock for the next session. And in between times, uh, check out the Twitter feed. Um, by all means, keep track of what Rachel's doing because if she's gonna be uh, offering that 10 million to us, look at where <laughs> it could take us. <laughs> Kakite. Namihinoi. Kia ora. <laughs>